Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. I don't know what it is. Every time I start these things, I just get such a rush of bliss. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm just happy. <laughs> what can I say? So this process works, huh? This uh, meditation, this philosophy, this way of life really works and delivers <laughs> the bliss that we've all been waiting for, that we've all been wanting forever and ever. Huh? So <laughs> let's pay attention to what Bhagwan says. He really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Since it is insentient, this body does not say I. That is, it does not have any inherent self-consciousness. No one says in sleep, where the body does not exist, I do not exist. After an I arises from sleep as I am the body, everything, all the second and third person objects of the world arises. When one scrutinizes with keen mind, where does this I arise? It will slip away, being found to be non-existent. So when the I is non-existent, also the world is seen as non-existent and the body. There's a reality test that the sages use to determine what is real and what is not real. And it's given in the Vedas. That which is, is always without change. So if we look at this world, if we look at this body, they're always changing, and they come and go. Huh? Not only at birth and death does the body come and go, it comes and goes every day in the morning and every night when we go back to sleep. <laughs> in, in dreams, while sleeping at night, we have another body. It's not the same. The reason it's not the same is that it has all kinds of powers that this body doesn't have, isn't it? It can change into this or that form or shape. It can fly. Huh? So many things that dream body can do. Because why? It's the monomaya kosha. It's the mental sheath. It's not this physical body made of food, anamaya kosha. Huh? No, so it doesn't have uh, the limitations that this body has either. That's natural. So we have one body in this waking life, and then we have another body in sleep. And then in deep sleep, even that body disappears, and there's nothing. No world, no senses, no forms, no existence, except good old unconditioned awareness, <laughs> the self, Brahman. So that is what we really are. Bhagwan talks about two kinds of I here. He talks about the original I am, the self, which does have real existence because it always is and it never changes. And then he's talking about the I that arises as I am the body. Oh, which body? <laughs> the body that we have in dreams or the body that we have in the waking dream? <laughs> they're both illusory. Why? Because they're always changing. This body is born as a, a, a squirming infant <laughs> and then it goes through several stages of growth up to adulthood. And then it gradually begins to decline until finally it disintegrates at death. Now, is this body 
a real thing? No. We can't say it's real because it's always changing. Doctors say every seven years all the body cells change. They either reproduce or die off. So what there is that's real? Only this awareness. And by awareness I don't mean consciousness. Consciousness means consciousness of something, usually through the senses. But when consciousness goes, there is still awareness underneath. So try to understand. We live in a world of illusion. We live in a world of dreams. All the sages say this. And why do they say it? Because they're watching, not from I, the ego, but from I am, the eternal awareness of Brahman. So from that point of view, one sees that all changes and passes away. So if all changes and passes away, it's all a dream. Some dreams are shorter, some dreams are longer, doesn't matter. They still have the same quality. So that's why this world is said to be an illusion. The world is said to be a dream because it's based on the dream of I am the body, the false ego, ahankar, which can only arise as an adjunct to a mind. And a mind is also a false existence. Basically, it's a bucket in which we just throw all our thoughts. And as we have pointed out, and the Buddha has pointed out, and Bhagwan Sri Ramana has pointed out, all these thoughts begin from the root thought, I am the body. So if we actually look at this mind of ours, and we try to see where does this thought, I am, arise? Not the words, I am but the actual thought, the actual conception, the concept. Conception means something new coming into existence that didn't exist before. Like the conception of the body has to happen first, then there's a period of gestation and then the body is born. Well, similarly, the self, or I, as the body, is also conceived and it gestates in the mind as fabrications and as name and form. And then it becomes a contact with the senses. And at that point, it's born. So because we have this false I, which we believe in passionately, if we only had such faith in the truth. <laughs> but... Uh, because we believe in this false I, when the body dies, we think, I am dying. But as Ramana points out, death is just a thought. Why? Because it's based on a thought. I am the body. If I am not the body, if I am the awareness that gives rise to the body, within which the whole world appears and disappears every day. <laughs> and if you take a nap twice a day. <laughs> so how can that be anything but the ultimate reality? How can that awareness, that pure, unconditioned, non-dual, objectless, eternal awareness, unlimited, unbounded, huh? how can that be anything but the absolute truth? How can that be anything but the reality on which the dream is based? You see? So what does it take? 
actually to transfer our sense of I am from the body, the false identity, to the self, the real identity, the real I am. Well, ultimately, it's an act of faith. Yes, you can go at it stepwise, gradually, and that's how most people approach it. In the beginning, for example, during the stage of bhakti, we advise everyone to chant the Gayatri Mantra. And this Gayatri Mantra, we've gone into in great detail in another series. This simply is worshiping the Brahman. Huh? But it's worshiping the Brahman from the point of view that I am different from Brahman. So what has to happen? At some point, we have to start thinking of the Brahman as I am. This is myself. I am the Brahman. Now, nobody can do this for you. Nobody can, you know, <laughs> lay the hand on your head and say, okay, now you're the Brahman. Boom. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you are not going to be given your real identity, your real self. It's impossible because you already are your real self. You already are the Brahman. You already are the I am, the eternal awareness underlying everything. And you have always been the Brahman. So all that's necessary really is to clear away all of the stuff that's covering it up, all of the false conceptions of I am. And what are these? Vasana. Vasana means a psychological tendency that lies dormant in the mind until an opportunity arises and then it becomes active huh? by the process of association. Like you see a desirable object and then immediately, boom, a vasana arises that makes you want to possess and enjoy that object. And so a bunch of mental processes spring up that make you uh, think that you can acquire this object. The whole idea of ownership is completely bogus. <clears throat> so anyway, we've gone through that as the root sequence, the mula pariyaya. The root sequence is the sequence of thoughts that occurs, that is overlaid upon every single perception and action to make it mine. Huh? And why is that? So that we can justify the existence of this false ego, this ahankar, this I am, the body. So just like a movie is nothing but a succession of still frames, uh, like this video, Yet there seems to be motion and continuity and so on. That's all just an illusion. Huh? The sound is going at 48,000 samples a second. And so even though it's just a series of blips, <laughs> because it's strung together very fast, there's an appearance, an illusion of continuity. And similarly with this I am, because I have, you know, or I think I have, I own, I have acquired this object, this thing outside. Then I also think that there is an I who has acquired it. See, it's an indirect proof. But the direct proof of our existence as Brahman is simply by thinking ourselves so. It's an assumption we make. Just like the assumption that I am the body, even though the body is just a piece of me. The assumption that I am Brahman is the essence of self-realization. It's an act of courage. 
It's an act of will. And it's an act of accepting what we really are. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Aum.